like that, it's a time for you to do a little soul searching and find out if it's really them out there that's doing it, the devil that's doing it, or you the one that's doing it. And when you start looking for that spiritual wisdom, that's when you'll find out, you know, usually because God will just and say, just look up here. Look up here and you'll get through it, you'll get over it. And the devil said, you remember back down when you did this? God told you if you didn't forgive that person, you were going to die of a heart attack. Now you're having chest pains. Ha ha. Huh? You see, we get those things in our mind because something else is putting them there. God knows every pain that you'll have. He knows about the back pain of the health. He knows what causes it. He knows what I did to create it and have it be there. You hit a semi head on a motorcycle, you're going to have some pain. And I can't take that to God and say, now look what the devil done to me. I run that thing into that semi and the Lord allowed it to happen. Okay? And I'll give you some more for instances. Preachers that are called into the gospel, I know this from experience, not the experience, but experience, that way they sit down on. Those that run from the gospel get into some trouble. Okay? And if the Lord tells us that He wants us to do something, and we go do something else, okay, instead of what he, he said, we have a message in the Bible that tells us what happens to people who does that, and one of them's name is Jonah. He took off, instead of going to dinner, but he went the other way and went to Joppa. Set out to sea, got, got thrown out of the boat, got swallowed up by a whale. Laid around that whale for three days. Oh, I, I don't wonder what it's like to be thrown up on the bank by a whale. I wonder about what it would have been like to be in that whale bed for three days still alive. Somebody said, you ever think he was alive or God? He was alive in that whale for three days. He had plenty of time to think. Okay? When you're running from the Lord and you get in that position, that's the time for you to do some serious thinking and then do some serious praying. Because bad things could happen to you at that time. Somebody said, how do you know? Experience. I know from experience. I can tell you a few times. Like when I hit that motor, that motor ship and went in that truck, I was the Lord. I wasn't preaching like I was supposed to be. You see, those kind of things happen when that head just lifted off of you. God's not protecting you anymore. All kind of things can happen to you. If you're walking in His will, you're protected by a hedge. Your hedge protection. Remember when Job first got into trouble? And, and when the devil said, you got him hedge. you got a hedge all the way around him. He said, you lift the hedge. And I get him. God lifted the hedge. God lifted it because the devil said, if you lift the hedge. You see, Ricky don't know it, but there may be some times in his life when the devil say, you lift the hedge off of him, and I'll get him. And God's going to lift the hedge off of him. It could be to his family. Amen. It could be off of his family. To his family, should be to his kids. His kids can draw him away from the Lord. But instead of teaching the kids about the Lord, <coughs> the kids drag them away from the Lord. How do they do it? They take them to ball games, play baseball, play football, play hockey, go fishing, anything that they want to do so that they never have to go to the house of God. God said, train a child in the way that she go, and he's only going to depart from it. I'm just quoting some scriptures. But we're going to get into some deep stuff in this Bible that some of you uh, will be thankful, I guess, for the Old Testament, because if it wasn't for the Old Testament, you wouldn't have the full understanding of this, this passage of scripture that I'm going to read to you. So Paul and Silas, they traveled together into Macedonia, but there was a reason for that. I'm going to open up with that. And I'm going to tell you this. Before the Apostle Paul ever left Tarsus, going toward Macedonia, the Spirit of the Lord already knew what he was going to go through. He knew he was going to get thrown in jail. God knew that him and Silas were going to be beat, thrown in jail. They know all things. He's already known. And they were walking in the will of the Lord. But there's going to be a test of 
testimony there. And it's going to be something that will be a good schoolmaster, not only for Paul and Silas, but it'll be a good school for the people that's not, you know, Christians. It doesn't believe in Jesus. There'll be a good testimony there. And when the Holy Spirit sends, sends somebody into something and there's going to be a turmoil there and havoc there, every time that they're sent to do a work for the Lord, the presence of God is already there. And I don't care how bad the circumstances get, when they're in jail, they can still shout the praises of God in midnight. Because they knew they were walking in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. They knew that God had called them in there. And they knew that they were walking and obeying Him. And the devil cannot change their testimony. They cannot take away the shout. I don't care how low it gets. You can still shout under the power and presence of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank God. Yeah. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Have a bit, buddy. Just go right Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much. Verse 9. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man in Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now him in the spirit, with the spirit when that call was made, in the middle of the night, he had a, had a call through the Holy Spirit, go to Macedonia. This man standing in front of him. The vision. We need you to come and bring the gospel to us. So the Apostle Paul, he laid around there and didn't go. That's why he got whipped. No, the next day he was on his way. Watch this. And after he had seen the vision, immediately he endeavored to go into Macedonia, assured the gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. There was a calling. And they knew that it was God who was calling them to preach the gospel to those people in Macedonia. They had to go. And when you look at yourself and you're saying, well, I'm saved. I'm called for the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a calling on your life. And the calling on your life is you're to be a disciple of Christ. Because when it comes to God, God called woman Adam, which means human time. It means you can witness for the Lord. You can practice discipleship for the Lord. And if you're called to be a disciple and you know that you are, then the best thing for you to do is get into the discipleship or you can suffer some things too. You're not, it's not just left up to the man. Okay? We're going to go a little deeper in this. We can get deeper probably than, than I really had planned on. But as they were traveling through it, they came from the to the Philippi, verse 12, which is the chief city of the part of Macedonia, and a colony, and, were, and we were in the city about a certain days. And on the Sabbath we went into a city by the riverside where prayer was wont to be made, and we sat down and we spake to the women which resorted thither. Now, we went to a woman's prayer meeting. I tell you what, I guarantee you, they were some getting home to God right there. When women get together and it ain't nothing but to pray, they're going to get a hold of God. If they get together for gossip and for a social gathering, that's all you're going to get. But they get, if they get together to be spiritual and get down with God, they're going to get down with God. Amen? So Jesus, he'll always show up. I tell you what, I've heard some women pray. They can out pray two-thirds of the men that's in the world today. They ain't very few. I mean, there's very few of them can still do it. But I've seen them get right down in the altar and just cry, tears flying all over that thing as they were crying and praying for their families and praying for this country that they live in. And they see that the country out of the city I lived in in Tennessee was in Drive County, wouldn't allow to sell whiskey or nothing in that town. And they'd pray for them bootleggers to get saved. They wouldn't pray for them to get arrested, they'd pray for them to get saved. If they get saved, they ain't going to do it. When I'm the law, lock them druggies up. Pray for them and don't save them. Witness to them that God will save them. Why don't you waste your time? It wasn't a waste of time for you to witness to me. It wasn't a waste of time for me to witness to any of y'all. You see what I'm trying to say this morning? It, you're worth witnessing to. You're worth me preaching to. You're worth me, me preaching to the one that I love so much about, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Let's get deeper. 
And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple, of the city of Tyre, which worshiped God and heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, and she attended unto things which Paul had spoken. Now, this is the first one to greet Christian missionaries that the Apostle Paul was on his trip. First record, a woman named Lydia, somebody that sold purple. Okay? You mean to tell me that the first one to greet missionary was a woman? Uh, sure. Now what's this? The first missionary saved was a woman. The first person saved was a woman. In Europe. The same woman, her name is Lydia. Make sense? A lot of folks didn't know. They don't know that. Why? Because they don't pay any attention to that part. They just read the, the gravy part of it of how Paul and Silas was in jail and they'd make a good law at 12 o'clock, praise the Lord, and going on. And some people called them fool. They didn't have to do that. All they had to do was say, Oh, God, deliver us to the best evil we're in. That's all they had to say. They didn't have to do all that dancing around and screaming in the holler. <coughs> God tells me to scream. I'm screaming. Loud. <laughs> You hear me? It's loud. I'll turn the mic up. Loud. Okay, now, and when she was baptized, uh-oh, Lydia was baptized. That means she was saved. So she's the first European convert. Was a woman. I wonder why the, that name was in there. You think it's just something we should read over and nobody study and not know, but nobody tried to figure out who she was. Or... When somebody puts a name in there, it's a story. It ain't a parable. It's a story. But she was a seller of purple. She created dye and stuff and made purple clothing. And it came to pass that we went to prayer. Certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us and brought her masters much gain by two slaves. I can sit down with a deck of cards and make bets all day long with a good night. But it's magic. It's magic. It's two slaves. Pretending that they're worshiping God and people are getting out of wheelchairs and going on ain't nothing wrong with them to start with. They just go into a place and, and they get paid for the evangelist to get out of wheelchairs and walk around, jump around and stuff like that. That's just slave. God does not need imitations. God's the real deal. He expects the real deal. I don't have to pony up for God at all. I gotta do it just be damn cross and walk around in faith and I get what he promised me. I don't have to pull tricks on people to see if God's moving or not. Make them have some, some belief that they can believe that, that God's in the house because somebody else run around in the church because they'll get up and do it and fall on their face. Or they'll run around in church and quit the service to go with and go right after what they're doing. But he said, the same Father Paul and us and Christ saying, these men are servants of the Most High God which show unto us the way of salvation. Now, this passage of Scripture here, you ever wonder why that if they were showing the way of salvation, that Paul said that they were demon spirits and made their masters much gain by this? Because that's not the way that it's written in the original text. He said, uh-oh. That's exactly right. It's not written that way in the original text. The original text says, okay, the same Paul and Paul and us, Christ saying, these men are the most, are the servants of the most high God, which show us and show unto us a way, a way of salvation. That means that there's more than one way of salvation. <laughs> you can come up any other way, you don't have to come up by Jesus. There's other ways you can do it. You see, there's something that's left open there from the original. The original text is it was written at 
show unto us a way of salvation. Now that's what she said. But it was changed and showed to the way of salvation because the person knows that they're, they're changed it there is there is only one way to salvation. But there is all kind of doctrine out there today that tells you there's all kind of different ways to be saved. I can sprinkle holy water all over you and you're saved. Well, part of that, I'll read some of that to you here in a few moments. There's all kind of things in there that people will try to distort your thinking and pull your faith away from the cross and the Lord Jesus Christ and what He did on the cross. I'm telling you, my friend, without the cross, you are doomed for hell. And that's a fact, Jack. It true from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. You will die and go to hell. Amen. Let's get deeper in this. Now, and when the master saw that there was no hope for their gain, that they grow, they, they drew them into the marketplace of the rulers. They took them in so that they could talk to these people about what these guys had done done to their income. And that's what they were mad about. That woman couldn't walk around and do that anymore because the spirit wasn't there. When they cast that woman out of that girl, he didn't say come out of the girl. He said he spoke to the spirit. And Paul spoke to the spirit. He did not speak to the girl. He said come out of her. And he come out that self-same moment, that self-same time. That's when he came out. He didn't, he didn't wait around. Immediately he came forth from her. Why? Because he knew who he'd come up with, who he'd come up against. He'd come up with a true man of God, somebody that was full of the Holy Spirit, that had a job to do and was bound to do it. He might as well get it over with because he's going to have to wrestle with Paul all day long. If he didn't, then he'd lose anyway. And the magistrates, they didn't like it because their income was gone now, buddy. It was gone. You know why one of the reasons why that they fight against the church so much? Look at some of these big churches that has 15, 20,000 members that pay their tithes to them every week. This deducted off the government's paycheck. Don't think for one minute that they wouldn't like to get rid of all that. But they know when they do, they're going to lose a whole bunch of votes. They'll lose a bunch of them votes of people that don't care what nothing about the church when they start taking that tax deduction away from them and everything for a 10% discount or a donation off your income, whether they give it or not, they still turn in 10% so they can get a tax break, a tax cut. The more money you got, the more you spend, the more break you can get. Find different loopholes, places to give you money to so that you can get it all back. Now, I gotta get on. I gotta get on. I'll, I'll be here for a different for the rest of the day if I don't. Okay. I want to do first. <coughs> well the Jews already got him and they took. They took Paul and Silas to jail. They took him to the magistrates. And the magistrates actually told them what they'd done. I'm not going to get down there. <coughs> I didn't say pray yet. <laughs> the magistrates, after they'd done what they tried, and they commanded them to take their clothes off. Took the clothes off of them, and then they beat them. Then they took them and put them in prison. Now, these are men of God in prison, right? They done been beaten, probably bloody, you know. They put them in the inner prison because the jailer was told not to let them out, not to let nothing. If they escape, you're going to die. So they put them in the inner prison where they could not escape. Bound them with stocks on their feet so they couldn't run. Tied their hands. So they, but they're still finding a way that they could jump, holler, and scream and sing praises unto God in the middle of the night. So loud that only other prisoners could hear it. I believe they were screaming at the top of their lungs. And if you can get anybody in church to say amen, it's like a
That's why everybody gets a shook up and turn turn apart the prop and get one down. Yes. <laughs> Scares them right out of their seat. But anyway, Paul and Silas, they sang praises. And the Bible says that there was an earthquake. You ever experienced one of them? I, I don't like him, I just feel it. Because that, that, that feels worse than my cell phone on vibrate. I can tell you. I don't like that. And when you, you feel that and that thing starts, well, listen here, according to the, the history of that earthquake, it killed cattle, it killed people, it killed a bunch of stuff. Buildings fell. It shook so hard that the prison walls shook so bad that the doors just sprung open. Now, they know why, what caused it. Because Steve Horsmeyer hadn't predicted no earthquake for nobody. You see, God moved because he knows somebody was doing something. Well, when the jailhouse doors flew open, the jailer says, uh oh, I'm going to kill himself. But Paul from the back said, don't do yourself any harm. <laughs> now, watch what happened. After this, we all know, we know the rest of that story, right? Everybody knows that story real good. Okay, now we're going to go on with the story a little bit. The next day, in verse 35, the Bible says, And when it was day, the magistrates sent the sergeant saying, Let those men go. We don't want any more of that like we had last night. <laughs> you let that much, you let them out of here, get them out. But now watch what Paul said. And the keeper of the prison told this saying, Paul, the magistrates have sent us to let thee go. Now therefore depart and go in peace. But Paul said unto them, They have beaten us openly, uncondemned, being Romans, and have cast us into prison and thrust us out privately. Nay, burn, but let them come themselves and fetch us out. I want you to turn back to verse 20 again. And brought them to the magistrates, it's talking about the apostle Paul and them, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city. Paul said, We're Romans. Now, it was against the law to beat Romans. You was not allowed to be Romans. You're not supposed to be <laughs> God's kids either. <laughs> but some people think they got away from it. They got away with it, but you don't. You see, when he went to the, ma the magistrates and told them, said, you come and get us out yourself. You beat us openly. In the streets, you shamed us. You took our clothes off of us. You laid stripes on our back. You hum humiliated us in the middle of the streets. And we're Romans. You didn't supposed to beat us. You come and get us out. So now it's on the other foot. Because when they come and get the, get the Paul and Silas out of jail and start taking them back out, you know what's going to happen? The people's going to say, these are men of the Most High God. They were treated wrongly. Now, they're having to lick their tag over and bring these guys back out of there because they are men that's carrying the way of salvation. They are the ones that the true blue called them of God. But they, if the testimony that happened the night before in that, in that jailhouse, if that wasn't enough, the magistrates showed we've seen it and we believe it now. So they come out of there strutting their stuff. No. They come out of the glory of God all over them. That's what they come out of with. The glory of God. They went on to work and do the work of the Lord. I watched. And it started with these words of the magistrates, and they feared when they heard that they were Romans. And they came and besought them and brought them out, desired them to depart out of the city. Now they asked them to leave. Now they had a, a reason for this. Number one is they didn't want Paul and Silas getting in their pocketbook because they had a lawsuit going right there. Hello. Think about it. Paul and Silas could have had them magistrates 
go through the same kind of country that they went through. I don't believe Paul and Silas did. I, I believe he left it up to God to take care of that. Amen. But let's go deeper. And they went out of the prison and entered into the house of Lydia, back in there again. And when they had seen the brother, they confronted them and what? They departed. We're okay. We're okay. It's going to be a lot easier for you to minister now because of what we did, what Silas and I did, what we went through. It's going to be a whole lot easier for you to minister now because you're rolling too. Okay? It's going to be easier. Just believe God and go do the work. It's been opened up. When you look at some of the things the missionaries have done for the, the Word of God and it's been brought to America, man, the door was open when they came here. There was no other gods in this country except the sun god and the engine with engines were served. That was it. And when they danced around the campfire for the rain, that, that language that they were using, it was God sent us rain. In their native tongue, that's what they were saying. God send us rain. We're going to have a barn. We're all going to die of thirst. Send us rain. Get them drums and get around and beat around that campfire all night long on them drums and everything. Pray for God to send us rain. Guess what? Paul and Silas was in jail and they sang at midnight. The door was open. I believe when you do something like that, you're praying to God Almighty that this is going to happen. That you, God's going to open the windows of heaven. They're going to have a flood in the desert. Because of the faith that was in that prayer that they were praying and who they were praying to. Chances are they didn't know anything about Jesus at that time. But they were still praying, God give us rain. God give us rain. The Holy Ghost rain. Verse 7, or chapter 17, verse 1. And when they had passed through Antioch and Apollonia and came to Thessalonium, where was the synagogue of the Jews. Now, Listen to this close. They were back at the Jews again. Where were they supposed to first carry the gospel to? The Jews. Right? Okay. So the Romans now carried it back to the Jews. Okay. And Paul, as in manner, was went to them. Can you see the cry? And three Sabbath days reason with them out of the scripture. He wasn't reasoning to them out of the book of Acts. The book of Acts hadn't been written yet. They were written witnessing to him out of the book to them out of the book of Leviticus. If you've got it and you're walking down the street and there's people coming towards you, 
you better start hollering out, unclean, unclean, unclean. And you better walk across the street if they're coming at you, there's nobody over there. You get out of the way so they can pass. And you're not allowed to kiss your wife goodbye no. When they leave to go to work, you're not allowed to kiss your wife goodbye or anything. Matter of fact, you can't even be in the same house with your wife and kids. So you don't know what it's like. You just walk up and shake somebody's hand. It's all been done away with. Unclean. Unclean. Jesus had compassion on the level of the mark. He said, I will be that clean. Right? But the lepers that we're talking about here in Leviticus, it's showing how that the cleansing from leprosy takes place. Remember he said, go and show yourself to the priest. That's what Jesus said. You go show yourself to the priest and you've been cleansed. Okay. Well, things happen when that, that has to happen. It's right here in the book of Leviticus. Those things that happen to the Lord Jesus Christ when he heals somebody of leprosy, it ain't just something that was haphazardly done. There was a plan in that all the way. And you're going to get the whole plan. Or not the whole plan, you get all that I've got. Okay, how's that? There's more to it, but you get all that I've got. When he talks about the, the plan of salvation, it talks about the sacrifice that had to be made for salvation to take place. Honey, you didn't just get saved without a sacrifice. There had to be a sacrifice for you to be saved. And that sacrifice came through the cross of Calvary. And by one person. One person from the Godhead, and that was the Lord Jesus Christ that it happened to. God incarnate. Okay, we'll get some deep in this before it's over. And uh, chapter 14 and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, This shall be the law of the leper. In the day of his cleansing, he shall be brought unto the who? The priest. Who's our high priest? Jesus. Okay. We're starting to fit already. Uh, he'll be brought to the priest. Now, and the priest shall go forth out of the camp, and the priest shall look, and behold, the plague of leprosy, be healed in the leper. Behold, if the plague of the leprosy be healed in the leper. Now, when we look at this, we see that the priest leaves the camp. The leper that's been cleansed does not come inside. The priest goes out to him. Okay, so he's not allowed in the congregation because he has leprosy, and people that are outside the world and living in the world are not in the kingdom of God, so they're not allowed in the kingdom of God. They're out in the outcast of it. They're not allowed to come into heaven because they're not cleansed. So somebody had to come forward as our high priest. Get to that scene. It's real changing. Jesus had to come so that we would have a high priest. Oh, thank God. I feel that. My toenails are starting to curl up. I love it. If it wasn't for him, and him being our high priest, we'd all be doomed for hell. But thank God we have an entrance into that city now. And you're going to read some, you're going to read some more of this with me, and you're going to love it by the time we get to the end of it. Sometimes I get down in my study, and I... I'm, I'm bound over my desk and all I'm doing is crying because this stuff is so rich and it's so pure. And I'm going, God's given it to me at that moment and I want to just run around the house a little bit. Amen. That's the only time I can run up in steps and not be out of breath. I'm going to run up in steps and start telling me this about stuff like I ain't even breathing hard. Let me walk, let me walk up and carry a cup of coffee and I'm about to fall over the top steps before I get up there. And the priest shall go forth out of the camp, come forth out of heaven, and the priest shall look and behold if the plague of leprosy be healed in the leper. Then shall the priest command to take him, take for him, that is to be cleansed, two birds, alive 
and clean. And cedar wood, scarlet, and hyssops. Now, there's only one person that can diagnose sin in you. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. It ain't me. I'm not your judge. I'm not your high priest. I'm the pastor of your church. But I cannot die no sin in you. I can tell you about sin. And if you're guilty, he's the one that died it. Okay? And he's also the one that cleanses it. Now, if it's been cleansed, okay, it's done away with. It's no longer there. Now, I'll prove that to you here in just a few moments, too. Uh, somebody says, well, I don't believe in that stuff you get. I'm telling you, it's the truth. It's the truth. God does not make mistakes. He does not, he does not quit. I'm saying, if you turn your back on the Lord and walk away, you're in some deep trouble. But if you've not turned your back on Him and you're still walking by faith and you're still not, not being troublesome to the Lord, I guarantee you, you're walking in faith, you're saved. Got proved in the Old Testament even. here in just a few moments. Somebody said, Well, the Old Testament was now added on the law. The Old Testament was a schoolmaster teaching you the laws of Christ. It also had that law of sacrifice that you do <laughs> two or three times a year. How many of you do that? I don't. I don't have to no more. All right, that was sufficient. Then, and the priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel over running water. Who was the earthen vessel that was killed? The Lord Jesus. He was the vessel. Okay. Now one of the birds, now let's, let's go deeper here. That one of the birds be killed in the earthen vessel over running water and for the living bird he shall take it and the cedar wood and the scarlet and the hyssops and shall dip them in the and the living bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over running water. The bird was killed, dipped in blood over running water. How many of you remember when Christ he stuck the spirit inside? Blood and water both came forth. Getting close, ain't it? It's getting close to the picture of the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm talking spiritually. And if you can't look at it spiritually, honey, I mean, you need to get something that you can. But this whole thing is spiritual. God is a spirit, and Him that works with Him is the spirit, truth, and truth. And I'm going to tell you something, there are people out there right now that they can't believe in the spiritual body because they can't believe God is a spirit. One of these days when you get to heaven, you're going to be a spirit. You'll be in the same image of God. You will be a spirit. But you're not going to be a little angel floating around the earth, stringing around some heart out there in outer space of work. You're going to a city that's built and maker of this God. That's where you're going. Amen. Sometimes we get our, our little whims mixed in there and it don't work. All right. But the two birds... I wrote this down. Two birds alive and clean, one will be killed and the other will be loosed into heaven. The one that's still alive after they wash it. Now we're going to read this. And the living bird shall take it to the, and the cedar wood and the scarlet and the hyssops and shall dip them in living, the living bird in the blood of the bird and was killed over the running water and shall sprinkle upon him that is cleansed from the leprosy several times and shall pronounce him clean and shall let the living bird loose into the open field. And he that is cleansed shall wash his clothes and shave all his hair and wash himself in the water and will make it may be clean and after that he shall come to the camp and shall carry it abroad out of the tent seven days. When he is proven to be cleansed. He now has the right to have contact. I think 
about that leper in Mark. How that when the tax collector went around his house and knocked on his door, and he comes to the door with a leper seat. His wife hanging on his arm. Because they were glad they got united again. And I thought about marriages. Well, the marriages were set in relationships were just in the toilet. They were in there so bad that the couples hated each other because of the stuff that was going on in one and the other one didn't have it. And, and they were trying to survive on what they had and what they were going with. But here this turmoil was with them all the time because one of them was covered in leprosy and the other one was white. There was no balance. No balance. The leprosy, most of the time it comes through somebody that knows it all. It's my way or the highway. My wife worked for a man like that over, and she didn't have a problem with that. Because it was easy for her. She didn't want to do it her way, no way. Her way would have created more work. She just did it the way he wanted. She didn't have to work hard. But my way is not God's way. God's way should be my way. And when this man was standing in his living room, tax collector coming, he was paying them taxes, just glad that he could be there to hand to him, him take the money and not worry about having leverage. All those blessings that God had given him, he didn't mind doing what he was supposed to do. So much so, you didn't read that in our note, but I read it in here because I know spiritually that's what I would have been doing. I'd have been so glad I had money and I could touch the tax collector and say, Here's your money, dude, take it and get on back up our quiet house and get it to Trump. Thank you for getting to it. I don't care what you do with it, just get it out of my hand. I'm paying it like I'm supposed to. But when we look at the leprosy, all of us, sin in your life is leprosy. And one little bit of sin, one little sin can grow into a covering to where it covers your whole body. It covers your whole heart. Your sin becomes the dominant force in your life. You're not only running from it, you're trying to hide it. And you're miserable. You're miserable. And somebody says, well, how do you get rid of it? You come clean with God. You come clean with God. That's how that you do it. We'll go, I want to read this one more here. I want you to notice this real close. Now, verse 7. And he shall sprinkle upon him that is to be cleansed from the leprosy seven times and shall pronounce him clean. Oh, the crowd from the cross. The one that sticks out in my mind the most that the Lord Jesus said when he was on the cross is when he looked down and he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And he took that this and he took the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and he sprinkled it over Danny across his head. And now I'm saved. But watch this. Seven times is God's number for completion. Seven times. Someone say Christ is our great high priest. Christ is our great high priest. Whoever Christ cleanses, they are cleansed indeed. Amen. He is the great high priest, not me. Not some doctrine nowhere. He is the high priest. He's the one that does the cleansing. You can't cleanse yourself. I can't cleanse myself. I can't save myself. I cannot keep myself. The only way I can be kept is to the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and my faith in what he did on the cross. and said, Lord Jesus, I love you. Keep me. I believe that every drop of blood on Calvary you would have shed it all just for me if it would have took that to save my soul. And I believe you from my heart. 
But I'll tell you what, by the time my grandma got done praying for me when I was just a baby, I know more about the blood of the, of, of the Lamb than most preachers know about today. They don't want to know about it. They want to know about what they can bring in the door that will keep the lights on in this building. I'm more worried about what you take out of this church. I want to close that. What you take out of this church is the most important thing to me, or to me. When you walk out, I want you to walk out with the gospel. I want you to walk out with what's in that book. What God gave me to preach to you this morning is from His words. It comes by prayer and fasting. And somebody knows I don't have to do a whole lot of fasting. You tell that to If I did, if I did that right, I'd be a whole lot liver. Liver. But it comes by prayer. Taking the time out and going down and sitting at your table and your desk. That's the fasting I'm talking about. Depriving yourself of happy time somewhere else and getting into the splendor time of the Lord. So the longer you sit there, the more you're going to be blessed, I guarantee you. The more you'll know, the more you'll understand why Jesus loves you so much that he would come and die for you. He's already seen hell. They created it, remember? For the devil and his angels. He don't want Ricky Gray to grow better. He don't want Daddy Cross to go there. I'm not sure about Jamie. <laughs> I know he don't want Jamie to go there either. But when you see the picture that Christ looks at when he sees hell, and he sees those that he died for that are suffering and screaming out in the pains of hell, and it's just because of stupid stuff like not believing that he was the Messiah. That's, the, that's all he says. To be like Jesus is all I ask. That's all I want to be, is to be like Jesus. But in order to be like Jesus, I've got to be for Jesus. I've got to go to Jesus. I've got to know Jesus. And honey, if I live to be 200 years old, I'll never be like Jesus. But I can't walk in his footsteps. Yeah. I can walk behind him in his footsteps. I can carry my cross, not his. His, his cross, that ain't neither one of us can carry his. All of us together can carry Jesus' cross. But I can't carry mine. And I'll tell you what, when he saved me, I got the sevenfold blessing. It was complete. It's been completed. Yours has to if you're saved. It is too. You want to give it up and give it away, go ahead. Because why do you think you can do that? Well, uh, I'm not sure that you're right there. You might be one of them that's saved by the skin of your teeth because the Bible says they were ten virgins. Five was wise, five was foolish. Five of them had lamps, so they had them have turned on at one time and they let them run out. And when them lights run out, the bridegroom, when he comes, he couldn't see where they were at. So he kind of got the, the five that had their lamps burning, took them with him. And they couldn't, they could not make it because their light would not turn back on. Once your light gets, it's blown out. You went too far. I had a guy tell me one time, he was a, a musician that bragged about playing with Lord Red Lid and all them down there in Nashville. He told me, he said, Danny, he said, I went too far. He said, I used to be a Christian. He said, I went over the line. He said, I lied to God's people to get money. I told them I had cancer. Now I'm dying from cancer. And I know it's too late for me. Everybody said at one time that they knew that that man was trying to live right for the Lord. But then the glamour and the running and never coming back. Remember the story about Jonah we started out with? I've run into it all my life. I've run into preachers and 
jump up and want to preach and go and go and go and go. And then about a month or two later, they're trying to hunt something else to go do. Anything to get away from what they was called to do. They thought it looks better somewhere else. I can't do anything about that. All I can do is just preach the gospel. It took me a while for God to just, you know, he's still, I want to tell you this, I'm still on the wheel. I don't know about you. I'm still on the wheel. God's still turning that wheel. I'm on it. He's still a potter. He's molding me in what he wants me to be. Okay? And when he gets that finished, he gets me what he wants to be. Then he's going to take that thing, he's going to pick it up, and he's going to look at it, and he ain't going to need it no more, but he ain't no work to do on it. He'll just put it on the shelf somewhere where he can be looked at. That's what will happen. So when he's done with me, my shelf he puts me on is going to be up there in heaven. I don't want to be. And I ain't got no problem with that. How many of you this morning have truly and honestly felt something in this message this morning for every one of you? I believe it. I know it is because that's what it's, that's what it's meant to do. If you didn't get anything out of it, honey, I'm not done with the job. I've just not done it. And God calls me to preach, but he calls me to preach instant, in season and out of season to rightly divide that word. And you can't rightly divide it if you're separating. Okay. If you're taking this and pulling it away from that and not put the equations in there on it, old from the new, you're leaving the big part of it out. Big part. We're heading into a season right now where some great things are going to happen to y'all in the Baptist Church, I promise you. God told me too heavy, and I'm knowing that he's getting ready to move in a miraculous way in this church. We're going to go into revival. Not this week, but next week. We're going into revival. We're going to go the whole week. We're going to have praying for the sick. I've done a talk with Mike about singers. Uh, Sam Jones and Plum Line will be here at the end of the thing on the the 28th, we're going to have some food back there. Bring plenty of food, sir. We're going to have chicken and, and stuff like that. We, we decided to have chicken. Anything else, you buy higher than the chicken is. We're going to buy chicken. Yes. Huh? Yes. Oh, hams. Oh, we ain't doing chicken. We changed that. We're going to do hams. Uh, who can cook a ham? Who? Two or three, okay. But we've already got two. Okay, well if you're going to cook a ham, let maybe sort of lean or know, right? Yeah. So they'll, they'll be getting the menu together. And uh, I'm going to make one of my chocolate cakes. <laughs> my, my chocolate cakes are all from scratch. I get in there just like chickens. <laughs> 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 no, we're going to have a feast. We're going to have a good time that day. Sam said, just please save him a Sam match or something because they're going to leave their church and come straight over here. We're going to have a good day at Sunday. Well, we're day breaking. And uh, if you come Sunday morning, you're going to get fed. Two times. Okay? But I, I'm going to hold the altar. I'm not going to close without the altar. They miss on the face. 